So, so my, my task here is to really to, to set the stage for, for a discussion of, of uh, mitigation. And my way of framing that, framing this is, is what, what are the prospects for, for managing the climate risk, which is really, in, in my terms, a mitigation, a mitigation problem. I'll talk about a lot of the work I would use comes out of this joint program on science and policy and global change, which is a group that uh, works on these issues uh, at MIT and in collaboration with lots of other folks. So we can talk about that more in the discussion uh, if, if you'd like. Now to talk about to talk about mitigation, I have to I have to warn you that, that the discussion of mitigation is a is a bad is a good news bad news story. You know, a, 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 a little bit like the guy that goes to the, the guy that's been arrested, accused of murder, <laughs> and is doc and his lawyer lawyer comes to him and says. I've got some good news and some bad news. And he said, well, well, what's the bad news? He says, well, they've typed your DNA and they found your blood at the crime scene. He says, what's the good news? And he says, well, your, your cholesterol is down to 160. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that, that sort of conditions you for what we're going to talk about here. Now, this is a group that doesn't need motivation, but just to get the blood from like, let me just, just a quick word about what's at stake here. This is a wonderful picture by the Union of Church, the study of the Union of Concerned Scientists about about what the about what we what about one way of thinking about what happens with climate change. Let's see, is there a no there was a anyway. What happens is it is, is, is depending on the for, on the forecast you have, on the on the projection that you have of, of emissions, over a period of 50, 60, 70 years, over the lifetime of some of you sitting in the room. We're talking about a very different state. And this is just one example of this. I, sh I wish I had a better example. This example works, this picture works a lot better in July in Boston than it does in the winter. But th this, is a, th this is just one example of, of, of the kind of adaptation that, that uh, people, e ecosystems, economies, economies are going to have to have to deal with. And uh, it, it's, it's just one picture not dealing with a lot of issues like fire and Severe storms and sea level rise, and, uh, and lots of other issues. And if you're interested in the this aspect of the problem, you're interested in the kind of effects and adaptation kinds of issues. There's a huge and very valuable piece of work that's available. There is a national climate assessment being done by a group in the in the federal government, organized by the uh, by the by the federal government's uh, energy and uh, environmental and cl climate group called the National Climate Assessment. It's, it's out for public review now. It's not a finished report, it's out for public review. But if you're interested in that and want to look at any of the details of what the effects, potential effects are for the United States of, of these kinds of forecasts, just Google National Climate Assessment, it's easy to, easy to find. And, it's, and it, has, it has a lot of, a, a lot of, a, a lot of detail, a lot of detail in it. Now, where are we headed? We, we do a lot of work on, on, on the, 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 uh, both the economics and the science of this and, and, and forecasts of, of this and, and looking at, at what, what, what is the risk that we face going forward in time and the way we convince that, the way we kind of uh, show that to people is we, we convert it to a roulette wheel. This is the roulette wheel we are spinning now. This is a sort of a thought experiment. If we went ahead with the level of climate greenhouse gas mitigation that we have now, that we have in place now, and we ran at the end of the century, what would be the forecast of what happens? Well, we don't know what's going to happen to economies over the century, so there's a lot of uncertainty there. And we don't know what the response of the climate system is to those emissions. But this is our estimate of what would happen. We're spinning, we're spinning this roulette wheel, and, and, the, and the, the temperature changes that we're, we're talking about here, maybe a median, if you draw a vertical line to the bottom of this, you get the median somewhere around, somewhere around five degrees. And risks of very, very high levels of, of temperature change at, at, a global, at a global level. So, so we, we are facing a, a, a giant, very serious planetary risk. That's all I'll say. This, is a fill, this, this, uh, this audience doesn't gather of people who didn't care about this issue. So I'll say more. But the question is, what does mitigation have to do with this? How do you think about mitigation? What's the role of mitigation in this kind of, in this kind of circumstance? And uh, the way we normally
really think about what we often think about mitigation is that we're trying to limit the concentration of the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And, and here you have a plot of, of, of that. Uh, this, is, this is a plot that runs from 2004 to, to 2012. And on the vertical axis is the, is the concentration of these greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And there are three series. The bottom one is CO2, and you see the wavy line of the CO2, that's the earth breathing in and out to see the season, and then a line that, that uh, does the annual average. The middle one are the Kyoto gases. That's the CO2 plus methane, nitrous oxide, and the, and the, and the industrial gases. And the top one there is all those gases plus the, the Montreal gases, the, 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 things that, uh, the, the things that you used to have in your air conditioner. And the, and, and the pre-industrial, this number was about 275, 275 parts per million of, these, of, of the Kyoto gases in the, you know, in, in the, in the in, in, say, in the middle of the, 18th, middle of the 18th century, beginning of the 19th century. And the standard analysis that most of us have who do this work is that if we wanted to keep the temperature change in the Earth the two degrees C above pre-industrial, the concentration in the atmosphere that gives about a 50% chance of achieving that is 450 parts per million. That's a kind of a standard number that people use. So I plot the 450 parts per million. So, what is going on? Well, we just have this relentless change, it, year to year, going up just linear year to year. So if we're gonna try to avoid this two degrees C, which is the concentration of the temperature change that you see a lot if you read the literature in the international negotiations, we keep agreeing that two degrees to C is the, is, the, is the goal. We are about to blow through that level, which would, give you the two degree C result. So we're, 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 uh, we're, we're running into very, very serious water in the sense that we are creating a circumstance where we're gonna have to deal with some of this climate change, uh, with whatever, whatever we are able to do. Now what's the role of mitigation in this? Well, we need a different roulette wheel. Mm -hmm. We don't solve this problem. We don't cure this problem. We don't stop climate change, if you see the, my, my previous diagram. Now you know that it's a, lot, a lot of it's already taking place from the changes in temperature over the 20th century. But what we need, is, what we want is another wheel. We want a better wheel. Now, this is a wheel that we, that we calculate you would be, we would be facing if we thought we could limit those concentrations to 650. That's a little more feasible than 400. And if we could live at the 650, then the risk we face would be different. So the, the, there are two or three points I want to draw from this picture. One is the nature of the, of, the, of the mitigation problem. The reason we're trying to do this, we're trying to mitigate the risk. We're trying to manage the risk. It's a risk management problem under uncertainty. There's not some fixed target that we, if we, if we meet that target, we solve the problem. No, we're managing a level of risk or we don't know exactly, we don't know exactly how the system is going to behave. Second point is, if you look at the difference in these two, in these two wheels, even achieving 650 has, it makes a big difference. It, 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 it's worth, worth, worth working toward, toward, even though we may not be able to meet the, the, the 450 target that's, associated, that, that's closely associated with the numbers that our diplomats tend to, turn, tend to talk about. And the most important thing about this, most thing, important thing about this wheel is is what happens to the upper tail of the risk. Mm. One of the, the most important thing here is that you notice that if, if we could just limit to 650, you, you, do, you do lower the risk substantially, but the main thing that happens is that the risk at the very, very high end, like five, six, seven degrees, those, are, those disappear. That is, that anything you can do, anything we can do to lower global emissions will have its biggest effect like, at the upper end of the tail of outcomes, that is on the worst possible outcomes. So when depression comes and you don't think we're doing enough about this, it's the, the way you keep going, the way you get up in the morning, is to know that almost anything you can do has its biggest effect on the worst outcomes. We 
which means it's, it's worth keep fighting for this, even though some of these targets we talk about are going to be hard to meet. So, so what's the task? You know, what do we have? What do we have to do? Those, remember those points. We're going to come back to them. Here's here's an outlook for energy in oh, going up just now to 2050 as a, in some of our work. Energy then is the major source. Energy use is the major source of of greenhouse gas emissions. So you have you have greenhouse gas emissions, coal, oil, biofuels, gas, nuclear, hydro, and renewables. You get the, you get you get the, the scale of the energy energy uh, energy system. And what you and this is and we divide what you see in this figure are, are three groups of nations. We we divide the world into into sixteen countries. The, the the group that's called developed that's the U.S., the EU, uh, Japan, and Australia, New Zealand. And the, the, the middle is the, what's called the other G20. The, the G20 is a group of nations that meets to deal with various things, including climate. And that's the BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, India, and China, plus Mexico and <coughs> the dynamic Asian economies like Korea and Taiwan. And then the rest of the world. So what do you see in this picture? What you see in this picture is that this is this is a global problem. This is a this is an inter, this is an in, international problem. And whatever we talk about in terms of mitigation, and we'll talk mainly about about the U.S. It, it's important to, to keep in mind that, that whatever whatever we're doing, it re, needs to relate to ways that we can bring the world to these to, to, to control emissions. And in this, in this picture, you see the core issue that we will come back to later is that is that the rich, the richer countries are sort of stable now. We forecast that the, the emissions to the rich countries wouldn't go up very much now. That doesn't solve the problem, but it's helpful. The big issue is that, we, is that in these other countries, which are poorer countries, you have this huge forecast growth. This is, this is heavily China, but it's all, these, all the other countries. These other countries producing these, these growing emissions and also the, the rest of the world outside the G20 producing producing these these uh, these increases in, in emissions, and this leads to a set of a set of tensions in any international negotiations about who does what. You know, you're rich, I'm poor. You're not doing anything. Why do you want me to do something? And this is the core I issue in the, in the in the mitigation problem. Also, a related issue which we we'll come back to is the, is 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 the is the demand not only for some sense of equity on who goes first, but the kind of financial transfers that you would think might be equitable in order to in order to encourage people who are on a growth path and who are, and are who are at this stage less wealthy than the countries on the left. What kind of financial subsidies should 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 be provided? And and and, and so that there are unresolved problems in the international negotiations. Uh, and, and there are many, many versions of them, but they come back basically to that fundamental equity problem that you see in this in, in this picture. Now, just to keep us on the on the same page about about the problem, it's not at all it's not all energy. Uh, the, the, it's not all CO2. So the, the, this is the this is the total greenhouse gas emissions. This is same this is the same projection. So a lot of it is fossil fuels, of course. And a, a good deal is land use. This is deforestation, largely. Then methane. Methane is also heavily from some from fossil fuels. Methane is heavily from agriculture. And then you have the and then you have the purple one, which is nitrous oxide, which is also from agriculture mainly, some industry. And then the other gases. So just keep in mind that it's not just in, it's not just fossil fuels. Uh, it's not just fossil fuels. Uh, that, that are being uh, that are being burned. It's 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 methane from other it's methane leakage. It's methane from livestock. It's methane from uh, from, uh, from uh, manure management and the like. So there's a lot of other, a lot of other issues that we will come we will come back to. So just keep that in mind. And if you do this now in terms of the emissions by major group, this is the same major group. So you have the developed world at the bottom. And then we have the other G20, and we have the rest of the world. So this is our projection, one projection, of what we think we're on a track to do if we don't have additional policy over the next 50 years. Now, one of the, 
most important points that, that, that we have to make in any discussion of this is that stabilizing the emissions doesn't stabilize the concentrations. Uh, stabilizing the emissions requires really, to stabilize, stabilize emissions at whatever level require very, very sharp drops in the stabilizing concentrations requires very substantial cuts in the, in the emissions, even to close to zero by the end of the century. And so, so this is the scale of the problem we face if we think we're going to stabilize emissions. So there is the, there is the mitigation problem. To deal with the deal with the with the uh, equity problem, the international equity problem, uh, and and achieve something like this over a, over a century. So it's not a short term problem; it's a long term problem. But the scale of, of the scale of the problem is very very large. Essentially, decarbonizing the economy over 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 a century. That's what we <coughs> are trying to do. Now, for twenty years. We've been trying to do this at the international scale. We've been trying to develop an international regime to do this for 20 years. And, and the major, major focus, of this, focus of this has been a set of UN legal, UN legal regimes. So there is, the, the, there is, beginning in 1992, the Framework Convention on Climate Change. And under the Framework Convention on Climate Change is the Kyoto Protocol. And under the Kyoto Protocol, a subset of the richer nations were to agree to cut emissions over a, over a time period of 2008 to 2012. The United States never got involved. The United States, President Clinton signed that Kyoto Agreement, but we never ratified anything. And and and, and first president and second president Bush uh, uh, essentially backed out of any commitments they had made on the Kyoto Protocol. So the Kyoto Protocol has kind of limped forward. It is now essentially over and dead. Because, because Mexico and Canada and Japan and Russia, who were previously involved in it, backed out. So the Kyoto Protocol now just involves the European Union and uh, and and New Zealand. I mean, and Australia, because New Zealand is backed out as well. So that so that of the countries that had these commitments, uh, uh, the, the number of these countries, particularly Canada, Russia, uh, and, and New Zealand. And Japan, for various reasons, have backed out of the Kyoto Protocol. It essentially achieved, it achieved a lot in terms of defining the rules and getting the accounting systems right and, and, and developing lots of institutions and such. But it, 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 it essentially didn't, and it has been for, it has been projected for the 2020, but it's essentially closed down. Later, there was an attempt to bring in the United States through developing another negotiating system called System for Long-Term Cooperative Action. The United States was supposed to be involved in that. It went along. It didn't really ever get anywhere. There's, a, there's thousands of thousands and thousands of miles of air travel of people who participated in these negotiations. And, and that essentially has also been drawn to a close. There were some commitments made in Copenhagen when, when President Obama went, and people, and there were some voluntary commitments that have been made, those are probably going to go forward, but then that's relatively small. All that system in the international domain has been folded into something called the Durban Platform, from a meeting that took place in Durban, where the nations have, are going to make another run at this. That is, they're going to, they have made a commitment that by, by 2015, they will negotiate a new agreement to, 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 to uh, to make cuts that would go into effect by 2020. <coughs> we'll, we'll be able to do that. We'll come back and discuss that, about whether it would be possible to, to reach any substantial agreement to do that in this, international, in this international domain under the UN legal regime. My own view of this, to stimulate the discussion, is it's not really likely going anywhere. Now, it has gone along all this time with the United States more or less as a, an observer. So that we have not been a major player in this, and the fact that the United States was not participating, but the United States was not itself making commitments, made it almost impossible to make the argument that I just argued has to be made for the developing countries to take commitments. Things could change, but I, uh, th that's open for discussion, and there are some folks sitting in the room who may have views of that, we can discuss that. Now, this has been the major, from the start, has been the major venue. But 
But that's not the only venue. There's, there's, they're essentially in this domain of trying to work out a mitigation, a mitigation, a mitigation a, 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 some kind of mitigation agreement internationally. There is really a whole complex of things going on all at the same time. There are bilateral initiatives. So we have various bilaterals with different countries, for example, with India and others. The EU has various bilaterals with, with uh, China trying to do things. They use an economist's word, there are clubs. Other groups where, where people get together and, and try to meet some kind of agreement to do something. So you have the Major Economies Forum is, is a group of countries originally put together by the second Bush administration, put, pushed along by by the, uh, by, by, the, uh, by the Obama administration, where people get together, try to agree about what they might do. That's a group of about 20 nations. The Asia-Pacific Partnership is something else. We were talking about technology change in, in the Pacific region. There's the G20 I already mentioned, and then if you watch the newspaper, the G8. G8 is the, is the meeting of financial ministers and heads of state. And in various of these G8 meetings, the climate issue has been the top has been the top issue on the, on the G8 discussions, and then the G8 invites in some developing countries, it's called the G8 plus five. This is in these international, all these other international meetings. It, it, may, it may ultimately lead to something different in, in, different, in different domains than in the UN legal regime, which involves something like 190 countries. Then there are all these other agencies that are engaged in trying to find ways to push this thing forward. There are, uh, there, 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 are, there are a whole set of UN agencies, the World Meteorological Organization, the United Nations Environmental Program, the Food and Agriculture Organization, the United, United Nations Development Program, the, the uh, International Energy Agency. All these groups are have meetings and trying to find ways to do something on the mitigation side. There are some proposals to put things under the Montreal Protocol. The Montreal Protocol was on ozone layer gases. Some of those, there are some gases, small ones, that are climate gases that could be put under the Montreal Protocol. Another way to try to get a handle on some of these. And then there are the multilateral development banks that are also engaged in this, particularly the World Bank, which, which runs a fund to help do capacity development and support for activities in developing, in developing countries. And it also true is Bun the Ban Ki-moon, the, the head of the UN, is trying to organize meetings to, to try to generate, generate some kind of activity at the UN level. So it's a huge stewing about in this area in what is really the most complicated international agreement or national, international problem that the, the world has ever faced with so many nations that really, that, that, that really matter. And then there's unilateral, unilateral action that's taking place. And one of the more encouraging things is, it, is that, 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 that a number of things are going on in different countries. Is it is it uh, that the, the, the European Union has had strong political commitment to do something about greenhouse gas emissions? There's a they they've made commitments not only to a, the, uh, to a cap and trade system in their in their in their area. They have a number of targets and measures they're pushing forward. They have legislated changes in in the targets that go down over over time. So the EU is, has really made some. It's a small part of the world, but they've made some. Uh, there have been some substantial, uh, some substantial commitments. Cap and trade, the system by which um, you, set a, you set, a, set an overall uh, limit on the total emissions that allow people to trade their, trade their amounts back and forth to look for the cheapest solutions. There are various countries that are looking at these, or that are, that are, that are experiment, experimenting with them. Australia goes back and forth depending on who's, who wins the parliamentary election. Right? So Australia's thinking about doing it. South Korea's considering it. Brazil, Mexico, China, and in the recent in the recent 12-year uh, plan in China, there's a there's a big commitment on on air pollution, which has a substantial effect on climate uh, on climate gases, and then there's an effect on uh, there's a there's a, a commitment to an intensity target to to run down intensity means you'll cut the level of emissions per dollar of GDP. And they've made these commitments. They're not strong, but they, but they, but they're, but they're, they, they have, uh, they have real meat in them. They just, they're just not very tight. Brazil has made some substantial progress in limiting the destruction of tropical forests. What about the U.S.? Where are we in the U.S.? What's happened in the U.S.? Uh, what? 
what I would say is that in the U.S. we 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 essentially sort of at ground zero in terms of any national policy to deal with. And one of the questions is, is why is this? What what is going on in the U.S. and and I will argue for the, for discussion purposes that there are really a couple of problems. One is that is is the level of public understanding and concern and support for this issue is just lacking in the U.S. in relation to a lot of other countries. And the other is we've not had the political leadership. And and one of the most distressing things that's happened in recent years is what's happened to public understanding of this issue. Now this is work by the by the Pew Research Center. You don't have to necessarily agree this division between Republicans and Democrats and, and independents. But this is a set of this, this is a set of projections, this is a set of polls of, of, of belief that the earth is warming. Now you may say, duh, you mean people don't understand what's going on? I mean we have we have solid scientific evidence of the earth warming over the last century. But still you have you have a you have a decline over this period, beginning in, in, in two thousand between two thousand six and two thousand eleven. This is a survey. In, this is a survey about eighteen months ago, of a decline in in the in in the I don't like the word belief, but let's say a decline in the acceptance of the information that's available of the scientific information that's available about about the fact that the globe is in fact warming. This is the detection problem. So even at the level of detection, we have a problem of public understanding and public support uh, for this issue. If you look at what's called the attribution problem, how, how, what percent, if you do polls and you ask people, do they think we are causing it? What is the, what, do, you, do you accept the argument with, or, or, and the scientific analysis that, that puts forth the view that, that, that we're causing it? And once again, it may not be a surprise that people don't necessarily accept that, but what's really disturbing is it's going down. <coughs> that over this period, it's, it, the, 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 the acceptance that we have a role in this has, has declined over time. And whether, whether you hold to these differences among, among political views, I don't, I don't hold much for this. What's important about this picture is what's happened over, happens over time. Now, why is this happening? Given all the information that's out there, why is this happening? Now, anybody who, how many people read the Wall Street Journal editorial page? Okay, you know why it's happening. <laughs> Help me watch Fox News. I, I give you a quiz. This is a quiz. I'm, this, this, this is really, I'm sorry, this is not for the younger people, this is for the older people. And this is not so much for the students, because students don't have time to watch the elections. But those of you who watched the elections 18 months ago, here's a, here's a quiz for you some quotes. The jury is out. There isn't re any real evidence that we're altering the climate. It's the greatest hoax for many, many years. It's manufactured science. It's just another excuse for government control. The science is not settled on this. We don't know what's causing climate change. And your quiz is, well, match the names with the people with the, with the statements. <laughs> these are the names. These are the names of the people who were on, on your TV set, in, in, in really in the course of the, of, of, of the, of the, of the campaign. Um, I'll, I have a key, so at the end of the talk, I'll be happy to tell you which one is which. And of course, the bottom of this is the, the, the bottom of this is this. All right. This is a. This is a this is a, a, a sign put up by the Heartline Institute, and they use they use the Unibomb, and they had a program. I'm not sure exactly who they're going to. They're going to put up a series of these, a series of these signs. Uh, they were going to use Castro and and uh, you know Stalin and, and uh, Hitler and people like that, saying <laughs> things that the climate change do you. Now this was so bad. This was so bad that. This sign went up and then came back down because even the people who supported this kind of stuff thought that was really bad. But what is this? What's happening here? One, one of the things that's happening is that there's a lot of money going into this side of this issue. There's a lot of money that's gone in to essentially discrediting science. 
and uh, it, it comes from it comes from a, 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 a number of a number of sources. Uh, but big money, big money people supporting these kinds of organizations and putting money into campaigns and, and such. So that's one of the big problems. And and uh, I, one of the things that I, that I will say about this, with all this effort, I'm really an organized campaign to discredit the science, is that the argument about the credit, the, the argument about the science is not about the science. The people who don't believe the science are not talking about. I think the underlying issue here is people don't like the implications for the role of government in your life if you thought the science was right. And that's really what's, 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 driving, what's driving a lot of this. Now, the, the, and by the way, it's, a, it's not the case that we're not doing things in the U.S. So we're not doing much at the, na at the, at the national level, but it's not that we're doing nothing. There are many volunteer schemes here. The, 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 the Carbon Disclosure Process Project has got hundreds of industries cooperating and revealing information and the like. College university presidents have made all kinds of commitments. Uh, the mayors have an agreements. There's a, all sorts of federal volunteer programs. There are state and regional programs. You know, California has made major commitments. And that's really substantial because that's a country of, you know, that's a state of 38 million people. Power plant standards, uh, mentioned some power plants, renewable portfolio standards, forcing renewables into electric power systems energy efficiency programs and the like, and uh, regional agreements. And I say we should feel pretty good in Massachusetts about this in terms of the state of Massachusetts. I mean, Markey, sent, uh, Representative Markey was the key, key leader in the House earlier trying to deal with the climate issue. And of course, Kerry is probably the most prominent person in the Senate. And the other person who did huge things on the climate issue for Massachusetts, ironically enough, was Governor Romney. Because we have some very extensive programs in, in Massachusetts for mitigation and adaptation. They're really products of the Romney administration. And then there are various things that go on on the national level. There, uh, because of the Supreme Court decision declaring CO2 to be a pollutant under the Clean Air Act, there's been CO2 is coming to the regulation of automobiles under the auto regulations. They have a proposal out for limiting the emissions of new coal-fired power plants. Those are greenhouse gas related. There are all kinds of subsidies and standards for appliances and incentives for efficiency and technology and the like. The government spends a lot of money on technology, trying to, trying to develop a clean, cleaner technology. There are various federal executive orders and agency practices that, are, that have been put forth. Um, various other rules and regulations air pollution standards, biofuel mandates that aren't really driven by climate but have an effect on climate gases. So, so, the, the, so, the, US is, so the U.S. is not doing, not doing nothing. It's not big in terms of reducing emissions, but it's not doing nothing. And so if you look at what's happening in the U.S., if you look at emissions in the United States, the top, this, is, this is a picture of, of, the, uh, of, of, the, of the, degree, the CO2 emissions in the U.S. growing over time. It starts in 1992. And what you see here, of course, is it starts down in 2008. And what is that? The recession. So we have, so the recession has a big effect on this. But that's not the only thing that's happened. But the, this red line locates 1992 on the two graphs. And so there's, look at what happens to coal in, uh, in, in, in 2008. Coal begins to go down. What is that? Fracking, shale gas. That is the, the combination of the flood of gas going from almost nothing in 2005 to over a third of total gas supply in the United States through this, through this new shale gas technology has driven down the price of natural gas, further, further influenced by the effect of the warm winter last year. So there was not a demand for natural gas. So the gas prices dropped. And the gas price is so cheap that, that, the, that the utilities are switching from coal Yes, they may begin to switch back, but it, but but, but it, it's had a it had a, it had a substantial that's had a substantial effect. So that's where we are. We are sort of stable with the recovery from the recession and with natural gas prices get back to more normal levels. <coughs> probably the probably emissions are going to be relatively stable in the United States. But the good part the good the good part of the story now comes is that that we've had a big change in the leadership position. The administration 
has now made a commitment. The president has now said something about this issue. One of the problems with all this negative argument that I went through is that there was nothing on the other side, that the, that the president, the administration was silent for, 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 for years through the administration and never came up in the campaign. And of course, the issue is not strictly a partisan issue because there are a lot of states uh, that, whether they're Republican or Democratic, that, they're, that are dependent on, on coal. So it's, it's, it's both a regional and a, and a, and a national issue. So, 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 and then also we, have, we may have a change in public attitudes as a result of the events of the last year. Droughts, severe storms, sea level rise, Sandy, and all that. We don't know yet, but that may have some change in the level of public support for this, which might influence some of the political result. So the question is, how are we gonna go about doing this? If we can actually get some action to do this, to get, get a more aggressive US policy, how will this be done? And, and I, I just wanna talk about two broad ways forward, the ideal and, and the practical. So a little, this is a little economics for, for you. Uh, we did a calculation for a, a, a US greenhouse gas reduction between 20, 2015 and, and 2050, where by 2050 we reduced by 50%. Over that, over that period of time. And this is a complicated diagram. It's, it's a little bit backwards. So in this diagram, that's higher cost. And that's less emissions, lower emissions. This produces a, curve, this is, produces a figure that economists are used to, but most people aren't. So that's the way this, that's the way this diagram is drawn, so you know what, you know what you're going to see. And so in this diagram, that's excess cost. That's waste. And what you see in this figure is, is, a, is a kind of a frontier. This is the best we could do. This would be the lowest cost to get to achieve the results. If you want a 50% target, it would cost you know, a little over a trillion dollars over this period of time. Or an 80% target uh, by 2050 would produce, would, would cost maybe four and a half trillion over time. So that, you, you get this figure, that's, that's kind of what the best we could do. And that's what, we, that's what we would get if we used a cap and trade system or used a carbon tax so that, so that the, every use of greenhouse gas emitting activities, every, every greenhouse emitting activity would then have uh, a, a, the same price. And that, is the, that, would be the, that would be the least cost in terms of the effect on the economy to do this. And economists love this. Uh, and that's what the Waxman-Markey bill some years back was trying to do. And when people propose a carbon tax now, that's what they're trying to do, is to have this equal, appro equal approach to the climate issue across all, all uses. But that's not what we're gonna do. There are other ways to go about this. One is we could try to get it out of transport. So we could, we could crank up the, the, the standards for, for, for vehicles. You can do that, you get reduction, but it's very, very much more expensive to do it that way. We could go for renewable portfolio standards. By the way, these are all things we're doing. We crank up the renewable portfolio standards. So we would demand greater percentage of renewables in your electric generation. Well, that's down in the waste area. That's down in the excess cost area. Maybe we might do both of them together. You'd get more emissions reduction, but you have increased cost. Or you could combine, you could, you could combine the, 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 the tax or, or other price scheme with these regulatory things, it's still raising the cost. So you know, we, 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 we face a choice, we've always faced a choice by doing, going through this by actually charging for the pollution or, or going with a regulatory scheme. And that's not all, we also are doing low carbon fuel standards, which is being imposed in California. We have solar subsidies for wind and solar and other technologies where you have a, where we mandate so many gallons of biofuel. These are all regulatory measures, which will achieve some result, but they're much more expensive in terms of their effect on the, on the economy. Now, why don't we do a, why don't we do a carbon tax? Why don't we do this? And we're gonna, we can discuss it. We have experts in public policy. Why don't we do a carbon tax? We ha we've done analysis of this and we refer to this as the win-win-win solution. You had a carbon tax, and we did an analysis where you said we start with a carbon tax of $2, $20 a ton beginning in 2015, it rises at 4% a year. There's a carbon tax, the, uh, 
Uh, Massachusetts is part of the regional greenhouse gas initiative. It has a it has a price like this. It's lower than that. The European price has been as high as 35. It's now about 10. So these are the, this is the number in the in the in the range. And and it's it's a win 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 because it would lower greenhouse gases and lower oil imports if we did this. It would give you revenue that you could use to cut taxes. And it would help the economy. That is because of the tax interaction effect. The use of, if you, if you, had a, if you did this on a tax neutral basis and you take the taxes out of, out, out, of the, out of the greenhouse gas system and you use that to lower other taxes which have distorting effects on the economy, then you, you would have almost no, or even a positive, no effect or almost a positive, or a, a positive effect on, the, on, on GDP, on the growth of the economy. This could be a win-win-win. What people worry about is, what, well, what about income distribution? What about the poor people? Oh, you read the New York Times this morning. The, the, the New York Times left-hand column the paper had an argument about, well, this would be okay, but, it, but poor people use more energy. They don't understand the energy system. That's, they don't, they've not done the analysis of what will be the effect of this kind of, of tax. We did that looking at it, about the income cost by, by class. So what on the vertical axis here, you have essentially the pain. It's the loss of consumption of, 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 in percentage terms. And I put a big arrow there where zero is. So above that level is better, and below that is worse. And along the bottom axis, you have income classes. So the far left one is, is a family with less than $10,000 of income, and over here is, the, is, is, is with more than $150,000 of income. I know there are a lot of people with more than $150,000 of income, but this is what the data system in the United States uh, generates can do. And you have various, and what you have is various effects of, of, of what you do with the revenue, if you collect. If you put the revenue into into uh, a, a cut in the payroll tax, which is this dotted line, well, everybody's better off. Uh, everybody's better off. The, the, the lower income are somewhat better off than the, richer, than the richer people. If you take out the two colored ones, one of those colored ones is to cut the corporate income tax, the other is to cut the personal income tax. Well, of course, in those cases, richer people do better. The, the law, the, they, they get more positive effects. But the, but the overall effect on, on, on the lower income people is not, uh, is, is, is essentially negligible. And the green line is that he used the money to maintain social programs. Medicaid, Medicaid, Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security. In that case, of course, it would be a, a great boon to lower income people. And of course, there are many combinations of these that you could combine to gain uh, to gain some combination of things that, 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 you, that you want. So it, it, is a, it is a potential win-win-win. It has regional effects, of course. We have a big effect on coal. 22 states produce coal. A lot of states are dependent on low-cost coal firepower. <coughs> but what, 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 what we might talk about, and I'll, I'll, I'll address to our, my colleagues here, you know, why, why do we do this? Why is it so difficult to agree to do this when it's such, you know, such a positive idea? So. We, if, when I talk to the when I talk to the political types in Washington, they, they sort of snicker. They say well, that's a terrific idea. It has a probability of like 0.05. We're not going to do that. <laughs> and so the, the, the political types say, no, no, no. The the hope that you get is that in the fiscal in the fight over the fiscal over the budget and the fiscal mess, they need money. This is a way to get money. So the question is, would they would they turn to this to try? To do that, most people say no, but it is it is worth noting that uh, that two or three of the of the economists who've been the heads of the Council of Economic Advisors for the Bush administration uh, uh, have have come out in favor of this because this is fundamentally a Republican idea. But it's not. It, it, the people say it has no chance. We should talk about that. So what are they going to do if we don't do that? So we're going to do. We get, if we get the push, if we get the positive side, the good side, we're gonna, it's a good, good news, bad news story. We're going to do something, but this is what we're going to do. So the possibility is we could do more, we could do more limits on CO2 from coal. And uh, the, there is a regulation in process that would essentially <coughs> forbid the building of any coal-fired power plants. They could try to squeeze existing coal units, which is their other proposals to do this. This will be done under the Clean Air Act. And 
They could do more regulation of cars and trucks. It's already being pushed very hard. Probably not much there. That's another thing. Like, probably not more for cars. They could go after trucks. We could have a national renewable energy standard, a national standard of, uh, 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 with more teeth in it to force renewables into the electric power system. These kinds of things will be done under the Clean Air Act. There are probably some people in the room here who have experience with the Clean Air Act. It takes a very, very long time to do things because there's endless possibilities for lawsuits and and uh, and, and very creation of barriers in that in that system. We could do more on use efficiency. We could go more for standards. We could do more subsidies for wind and solar and cars and the like. Um, we could do something on methane leakage and and black carbon, which is another the greenhouse substance, which is another proposal that Secretary Clinton has put forth. She's now not in the, not in the not in the job, but has put forth. Um, the Keystone Pipeline. <laughs> there's, a, there's an argument for, um, the Keystone Pipeline has taken on great symbolic significance in that in the, when it looked like nothing else was gonna be done, we went after the Keystone Pipeline because it's bringing the, it's bringing the tar sands oil uh, to, to the refineries in the Gulf. And it is relatively carbon intensive oil. Not that big a difference, maybe 15% greater on a life cycle basis. And not worse than a lot of oil in California or Venezuela and such, but it's taken on tremendous symbolic significance. Uh, doesn't make a big difference in terms of the climate, but it may be important symbolically. And maybe <coughs> there are others here in the room that we ought, that we ought to talk about. So, so the question is, what are we going to do? And, and, and so these are the options we have. It looks like we may have a change in the mood. We may have some presidential leadership. We have had the first step of that. But I'll raise some questions for discussion, and I hope, I hope that the Dean Matthias will, will, will join me in this. One of the questions is, what's gonna happen in the State of the Union message? The President has made this comment in the, has made a very strong statement in the inaugural speech. What's gonna happen in the State of the Union? And whatever he says in the State of the Union, what's gonna be the relative priority given to the, this issue in the midst of the other issues the administration has? <laughs> Budget, fiscal fight, guns, immigration, international affairs, how much blood is the administration willing really to share on this issue? Because it's going to be a deep fight over all these issues because there's somebody on the other side of each one of these uh, questions. How, how, and how strong will the pushback be? If they try to tighten coal standards, what's going to happen? Because you have strong opposition from very strong, from very strong <coughs> electoral forces uh, and, and ideological forces against that. And what's going to be the change in what does the United States taking a different mode here? Does it make a difference, or will we make a difference in the international negotiations? How much difference do we really make? We've, a lot of the frustration with the, what I described as the international negotiations has been related to the to the absence of the U.S. And the U.S. was a good excuse for people not to take action. Well, if we begin to do that, what difference does that make? Will it make a difference? And, and how will this play out? It's going to be very interesting. The fact that you get John Kerry, who is un, in the Senate, the most <coughs> climate-concerned activist in the Senate has been John Kerry. Earlier it was, it was, other, it was other people, but it, it has been John Kerry in the last five or six years. Now he becomes Secretary of State. What happens in that, in that moment? So, we're on, the, we're on the edge of, of potentially something quite substantial happening, but, but it's like all these other issues. There, there, there really is strong opposition to everything that the, that, that, that the president will want to do using the Clean Air Act and these other, these other measures. And, and, and some substantial fiscal restraint on, on some of the spending that would be in some of these things. So with that, I'll close and, 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 and just hope we can have a discussion about what questions you have about this and maybe somewhat different views about, about where we are and where the country's likely to go. Thank you.